point of this is that the large, whenever you take a sample from a large population, you may get the wrong answer. But it'll be closer to the right answer the bigger the sample size is. So chance has a role in, and, and certainty has a role in deciding what answer you actually get when you do a study. Each time a sample is taken, there is some error in estimating what the true value is. The smaller the sample size, the larger that error will be. Therefore, to have a high degree of certainty, we need large sample sizes. One of the things that we can do is to estimate what sample size would be needed to be 95% sure that we have the right answer. Uh, and also it's possible to calculate when you have done the study what range of values, because you've done the study always with a sample, what range of values includes the actual true value. And Jeff showed you this morning that those figures with the horizontal bars going through the dots or triangles, then the confidence intervals. Those confidence intervals represent the range of values that could be consistent with the truth. And this, or the 95 that they are 95% likely to be consistent with the truth. Okay, so that's my very quick attempt, at, and not terribly successful, I suspect, attempt to try and explain sampling and, and, and error. Now the other thing I have to explain is um, confounding, and this time I think the, the, the example might work a bit better because I haven't used anything terribly technical. Um, sometimes, and this is really the major problem in uh, environmental epidemiology is confounding. Sometimes an apparent association between an exposure and outcome may be due to confounding. What this means is that another factor, a third factor, or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth factor, may explain the apparent association. And I'm going to give an example, not from environmental epidemiology. Well, it could be. So let's say that we find we do a study of an exposure, a new exposure, X, which we're concerned about, and it appears to be associated with lung cancer. We find that this exposure, X, appears to be associated with lung cancer. And this is a diagram like the one I showed you before. In this case, we have that of those who are exposed to X, 5.7% of the people have lung cancer, and of those who are not exposed to X, 2.6% of the people have lung cancer. So more than twice as likely to get lung cancer if you're exposed to this thing called X, which would on the face of it suggest that X is a cause for lung cancer, but certainly that it's associated with lung cancer. Okay, but we know that smoking is a very strong cause of lung cancers. And we also find out from looking at our data that more people who are exposed to it, the people who are exposed to X happen to be more likely to smoke. Um, so smokers are more likely to be exposed to X. And we find that among smokers, so we look just separately, at, rather than looking at the whole population, we just now look at people who smoke. And we find that when we look just at people who are smoking, 8% of those who are exposed to X get lung cancer and 8% of those who are not exposed to X get lung cancer. So among smokers, there's no association. And we also find that amongst those who don't smoke, there is no association. 1.6% in those who are exposed and 1.6% in those who are not exposed. If you compare that 1.6% to the 8%, you know that smoking is associated with a much higher rate of lung cancer, but X is not. So this is an example of confounding. So we can conclude that there is no independent association between X and lung cancer. And furthermore, that this apparent association is due to, to confounding by smoking. Sorry, I'll just go back to that. So the, the important message from that is that, um, that it's important, two things from that. One is it's very important to measure everything that could be confounding. Every other factor that could explain the association should be measured. But the other important thing to learn from it is that you don't always know what those things are. In this case, we know that smoking is the cause of lung cancer and that that was the confounder. But the problem in environmental epidemiology 
is that there are often unknown causes of the things that you're looking for, which are the, in the environment, which you don't know about and you don't measure. And they could be the cause of an apparent association that you see. So that's the, the art, if you like, of, of interpreting epidemiological studies. So how do we do this in practice? What sort of studies do we use? How do we draw inferences about um, the relationship between exposures and disease? Well, there are a number of different study types, and I'm going to just talk briefly about three. One are animal and laboratory studies, the second human experimental studies, and the third human observational studies. The last is the main one that I'll be talking about. Now, animal and laboratory studies is really the, the, the discipline of toxicology, um, which is an important part of the evidence base for the relationship between air pollution and disease. And one of the great advantages of this is that we do the experiments in a controlled environment, and therefore we can avoid all of the pitfalls that I've just been describing to you. We can avoid the confounding and bias. Um, we can have, we can, because they're animals, we can induce large variations in the range of exposure and therefore find the effects. And we can test, if, when we're using animal studies, we can test exposures that it wouldn't be safe to test in humans. Um, the disadvantage is that animals don't, um, is that we can only, there's only a limited number of things that we can test. You can't ask animals about their symptoms. You can't ask them about their quality of life. There's a range of things that you can't test in animals that you can test in humans. And also the other disadvantage is that it assumes that you can extrapolate both the actual effects and the relationship between the dose and the effects from humans to animals. Toxicology has been very valuable in looking at cancer-causing effects of, of environmental exposures. But it's, and it has some value in looking at the non-cancer effects, the heart and lung type effects that I've been mainly talking about and we've been mainly talking about. But its role in, in that is much more limited. It's really, its main role in, in this exposure science has been in examining the cancer-causing effects. Now the next thing is human experimental studies. And, and most of these are done um, in a laboratory setting, in a, in a, in a um, in a setting where um, you uh, can put a person, a, a, a healthy volunteer, in a, in a room, uh, and you, an isolated room where they're just breathing clean air, and you can control, carefully control, the environment in that room, and you can make a number of physiological measurements. And because you can carefully control the environment in that room, it's possible, just like it is with the animal experiments, to avoid any problems with confounding and bias. So you can get out of all of those conundrums that I was describing before. And again, you can induce quite large variations in exposure. One of the limitations of this is that it's obviously only possible to test short-term exposures. One of the things that we're interested in is the long-term adverse health effects of exposure. But you can't keep a person in an exposure chamber in a room for years. They don't tend to volunteer for that sort of thing. The most you can keep them in is, you know, a few hours usually, maybe a couple of days, but no, certainly not for years. And so you can't, you can only test the effect of short-term exposures. In practice, this, although they don't have to be in practice, most of the research in this field is done in using this methodology is done with young, healthy subjects, and they may not be easy to extrapolate from the effects on them to the effects on other people, older people. And usually they're not real life mixtures of exposures. In one sense that's an advantage because you can look at the pure effect of ozone or the pure effect of nitrogen dioxide. So that's an advantage over what measurements that are done in the real world. But it's also a disadvantage because in the real world in fact we're not just exposed to an individual pollutant, we're exposed to mixtures of pollutants. So we have done a couple of, this is a study that was quite famous one in, in London in the mid, early uh, 2000s, in which 60 adults with asthma uh, were exposed, were, were asked to walk up and down Oxford Street for two hours, and then walk around in Hyde Park, it's Oxford Street, London, and Hyde Park, London, a relatively clean environment, but, but not very far away. And their lung function and some other things were measured. 
And in this case, what it shows is that their lung function declined, and this is the same people. So it's comparing the same individuals during walking along Oxford Street and walking along, uh, sorry, this is walking along Oxford Street, and this is in Hyde Park. And you can see their lung function declined more when they were walking um, along Oxford Street than it did when they were walking in Hyde Park. And we've done a couple of, of, of similar studies, which I won't go into now in Sydney, do, using a similar sort of method. So, but the, a large part of the, the evidence that we use for determining exposure response relationships and, determine, and deciding whether what are the health effects of air quality on, on humans is human observational studies. These are studies in which we observe, we don't manipulate, we don't control, but we just observe the actual variation in exposure to pollutants and we observe the variation in disease states or health outcomes. So this, we're not controlling these, these uh, uh, exposures, we're, we're just observing what they actually are. We measure potential confounding factors, such as smoking, um, age, sex, um, socioeconomic status, household environment, a whole lot of other things that we think might bias the relationship, might confound the relationship between the pollutant and the health outcome. And we examine the association between the pollutants and the disease states after adjusting for these confounders. In practice, you don't need to do it in the way that I showed you with those tables before. We have more with fancy statistical methods for doing it. But it's in principle the same thing. So, this, what's, what are the sources? So I said we observe the variation. So, and I've earlier in this talk explained how important it is to have variation in exposure in order to be able to draw conclusions, to, to be able to see associations. So there are two sources of variation that we usually observe. One is spatial variation, that is variation across areas, between areas. And in that time, in that, we often use long-term exposures and we compare the exposures, long-term average, yearly average in practice, um, and compare this between different locations, often different cities or towns. And this is the slide that Jeff tried to show you this morning. <laughs> this is from, again from Bert Brunkrief, but it's the study of the Harvard Six City Studies. And I think it has come up here, it didn't come up there, this one. But this is a study, this is actually observing not just at one point in time, but observing people over a period of time. This is observing a population over a period from, of up to 16 years. And it's looking at one of those important health outcomes that I described to you before, which is survival. How long do people live? And what it's showing you in this slide is that in some cities, people live, people's survival was worse. In these cities, at, after, after a few years, there were less people still alive than there were in these cities. In these cities, there were more people still alive after a few years. And it turns out that the cities where people survived well were the cities with low particulate levels. And the cities where they tended to die earlier were those with high particulate levels. So this is a, a, a study showing the relationship between the level of particulate pollution in the city and the rate of death uh, or the survival uh, in, those, in those cities and showing quite a neat uh, relationship between them. This is, when we finish soon, yeah, I, I, I'll just go quickly through a, a study that I, I was involved with with Gar Williams, Lynn Jolliden and Lynn Denson in Sydney. Back in Australia, uh, on behalf of the, um, uh, well, what's now called SKU, and used to be called something else, I got all these acronyms going on, but anyway, it's, what, what we did, we, it was to collect data for air quality standards for Australia, for revisions of air quality standards for Australia, and what we did was look at spatial variation in air pollution by choosing 30 NEP and monitoring sites from across Australia. And they were, importantly, they were chosen to maximise the variation in pollution.
levels. Remember that I keep coming back to that, how important it is to maximize the variation in pollutant levels. And at each of these 30 locations, we, uh, we studied school children. In two schools, young school children aged 7 to 11 years. And the bottom line here is we looked at the relationship between the concentration, the long-term cumulative pollutant concentration, long-term concentration of pollutants at that site and the prevalence of symptoms and diagnosed asthma amongst children at, the, children at that site. And the red numbers here are the ones which show that it's a significant, in other words, not likely to have occurred by chance, 95% likely to be a true association. 95% likely to be a true association between long-term exposure to nitrogen dioxide and the presence of wheeze or asthma. These were actually in the opposite direction for ozone, and that's because of an interaction between ozone and nitrogen dioxide. But the point of that slide is to show nitrogen dioxide had small, but likely to be true, um, increased risk of symptoms and asthma in children. And here is lung function. Remember, this is, I've just, in that hierarchy of things that I described to you before, lung function is really a biomarker, a marker of risk of subsequent disease. But it does show here that children with, um, who've been, with their long-term exposure to uh, nitrogen dioxide was related to lower lung function and more airway inflammation. So the other way in which we can study um, we can look at variation, apart from spatial variation, variation between places, is to look at variation in time, or temporal variation. And this is usually looks at short-term, day-to-day variation in exposure to pollutants. And what this is usually done for is, it's done in two different ways. One is, we look and look for the relationship between short-term variation in exposure to pollutants, I'm sorry, and the occurrence of rare events such as deaths and hospitalizations in large populations like cities or multiple cities or in small groups or cohorts 